We are living right now in a changing ocean environment. And ocean acidification is one of the changes that we're seeing take place around Alaska's waters. My people have lived along the Copper River Delta for the last 3,500 years. EACs, historically, wherever they went, it was about subsistence in their food. So where they set up camp is why they named us EAC, the Throat of the Lake people. We, as children, would grow up subsistence fishing, gathering. All of us learned how to dig clams. We would shrimp fish. We would catch king crab. We would have some of the best seafoods on the planet every single day for our meal. Things are changing drastically. We as indigenous peoples, let alone any human in Alaska that lives here because they love this way of life, need to get out of this denial about climate change and ocean acidification. If you can't feed your people traditional food from the land and the sea, then you're gonna cease to exist. Ocean acidification is basically a carbon dioxide problem. It comes from the same root cause as climate change, where we are putting carbon emissions into the atmosphere through the activities that we do every day. Um, we drive our cars, we fly on airplanes, we generate electricity. Most of that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere, but about a third of it gets absorbed by the ocean, and that changes the chemistry of the seawater um, and makes it become more acidic. Alaska is more susceptible to ocean acidification than other parts of the world, primarily because our water is cold and cold water can absorb more gas. And so this puts us naturally at a closer threshold to where species might have trouble. So why does ocean acidification matter? Well, in the open ocean, it might be a problem that we don't need to worry about for decades, if not a century. The open ocean is basic, the changes are slow. In the coastal oceans, it's a different story. What we're finding is that in these coastal waters, which are often cold, which are often fresh, which are often impacted by local respiratory processes that increase the CO2 for natural reasons, because of this additional CO2 from anthropogenic sources, we're crossing thresholds and moving into harmful conditions. The species that are most affected by ocean acidification are species that make shells or structures out of calcium carbonate, particularly at early larval stages. Crabs in their very early larval stages have a significant amount of calcium carbonate in their skeletal structure. We know from experimental work on Dungeness crabs that they are sensitive in that stage to ocean acidification because of their need to form calcium carbonate. There are organisms that you may not be as familiar with called, called pteropods. Pteropods are zooplankton. They're a critically important piece of the diet of Pacific salmon in their first years at sea. We're very worried about cultured species, uh, clams, mussels, oysters, and the very early developmental stages, those organisms are planktonic and they have to build their shell as the most critical first step in their development. They've already shown significant impacts and, and aquaculturists have to take significant steps to mitigate the conditions in the water before they do their aquaculture activities. The most important thing that you need at a shellfish hatchery is good water quality. And typically you look at things like dissolved oxygen and temperature and sediment load. But here we also add the factor of what the carbonate chemistry is like because we've learned how important that is for the success and survival of juvenile shellfish. We constantly monitor the incoming water at the resurrection day and so we can observe daily what the carbonate chemistry is. We utilize the Berkelator, and it's a device that gives you climate data, which is what you really need to hone in on the accuracy of what your carbon chemistry is doing. So when we first started realizing that we had some measurements in Resurrection Bay that were levels of concern, we wanted to know if that was just in Resurrection Bay or region-wide. In response to ocean acidification, a number of folks have suggested the idea of citizen science as a way to increase our, the breadth of our measurements. So what we've done is we've developed a citizen sampling program where folks from all over coastal Alaska, including remote tribal villages, are able to easily and inexpensively collect samples that can be preserved and delivered back to a laboratory like that at Ludic Pride, where an instrument such as the Berkelator can do the detailed, high resolution, high accuracy measurements of those samples. The real work for citizen science and community monitoring for ocean acidification is being led by the tribes in Alaska which is really exciting and also providing an example for the rest of the country. The Chugach Regional Resources Commission oversees seven tribal communities in South Central Alaska. 
There's Eak, Tatitlik, Valdez, and Janiga in the Prince William Sound. Katuchek here in Seward. Nanwalk and Port Graham are in Lower Cook Inlet. And these are tribal communities. They all have environmental coordinators. And essentially what they do is every week they go out and they use a Yellow Spring instrument to measure the salinity and temperature and collect a sample for us. And uh, after they collect a couple dozen samples, they'll mail them in to us and we'll process them here as discrete samples at APMI. We view the Lutrick Pride Marine Institute as sort of the vector between the climate scientists that look at carbonate chemistry and the people who live on the ground and witness these things. And so by collecting and processing these samples, our data goes two places. It goes back to the communities and the people that live in these villages, or whether it's ocean chemists around the world that have access to our data. We know that certain times of year, waters around Alaska are already passing a threshold of acidity that could be harmful to certain species. Fall and winter tend to be the most corrosive time of year due to a number of natural factors, including phytoplankton, which in the summertime, um, big phytoplankton blooms happen in a lot of Alaska's coastal waters, including the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska, and they're sucking up carbon dioxide out of the surface water. Um, which actually makes the acidity go down during that time. Um, but then they die and they fall through the water column. And um, it's basically pumping that carbon down to the bottom water. When that deep, corrosive, colder water is moved up to the surface, then you can have what's known as sometimes ocean acidification events. We're learning so much about the local conditions that we would never have been able to determine from just looking at the open Gulf of Alaska, the open ocean, the global picture. What we're able to see by do making these measurements is that the different locations are all distinct. There's no one simple story for the coastal Alaskan waters. Sitka is different than Seward, is different than Ketchikan, is different than Kodiak, and you couldn't know that without a detailed sampling program and monitoring uh, instrumentation to assist with that. We think of ocean acidification monitoring as putting headlights on a car. We want to see what's coming down the road. What are we approaching as far as, as changes in ocean conditions? And the more we can see out in front of us, the more we as Alaskans can adapt and make sure that our communities are resilient and our industries are resilient. We've had more elders say that this project is something that's important to them because they want their grandchildren to, to be able to go out and harvest clams. We really want to make this sustainable and continue into the future so those younger generations have something to come back to and uh, harvest.